Thank you for tuning into Stepping Stones of Faith. Stepping Stones of Faith is a ministry of Claytonville United Brethren Church. Our service times are as follows. Sunday morning Sunday school starts at 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning worship starts at 10.30 a.m. If you would like to join us for any of these services, our address is 106 Elizabeth Street, Claytonville, Illinois, 60926. We hope to see you this morning. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this word. Father, help it to set root in our hearts. And Lord, minister to us by your Holy Spirit through this word that we would learn more of your character and more of your, your uh, person. And Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, <clears throat> we are starting a new minor prophet today. 14 chapters this one is, so we'll have to take a break around Christmas time and things like that um, for uh, Christmas week and stuff like that. So, but we are going to be looking at the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea, if you are in the Red Bible, it is page. 768. 768 is the introduction. We're going to start with that. We're doing chapter 1 today. Chapter 1 is 11 verses. And we'll be delving into that. But we're going to start first with the introduction. <clears throat> Hosea was likely written between 755 and 725 B.C., this book has the themes of rede redeeming love in chapters 1 through 3 and the judgment and restoration of God's land and people in chapters 4 through 14. Hosea was probably the author and the last to prophesy before the northern kingdom fell to Assyria in about 722 B.C., his ministry followed a golden age in the northern kingdom with a peace and prosperity not seen since the days of Solomon. However, with this prosperity came moral decay, and Israel forsook their God to worship idols. In a unique action illustrating how he suffers when his people are unfaithful to him, God instructs the prophet Hosea to marry a harlot. Her unfaithfulness to her husband is an allegory to Israel's unfaithfulness to God. This book reveals the depth of God's love for his people, a love that tolerates no rivals. So that's kind of where we're coming at, coming at this in that kind of direction. <clears throat> so starting in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Biri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the sons of Joash, king of Israel. So, Hosea was a prophet. He spoke forth the word of the Lord and applied the word of, of, to his life and to the people and circumstances around him. Hosea was a man, but he was a man God used to speak through. So, <clears throat> prophets, God used prophets to speak through them. So this, weren't, this was not their opinion. Um, this was God directly speaking to them. That's why today... We have these so-called prophets. Now, the so-called prophets today are those that uh, prophesied during 20, 20, 2019, 2020 about the election. And these so-called prophets prophesied a certain way. Well, these prophets are, were wrong and continue to be wrong. And so this begs the question, as it says here, that the Lord used the prophets to speak through if the prophecies are not coming true, then who's really speaking? One of the things in the Old Testament was that if they were a prophet and they spoke for God and God spoke through them, the prophecies would come 
true. And if the prophecies came true, then that's how they, you knew they were truly a prophet of God. The prophet of God, if, it, if they were not, if they did not come through, then they were to be stoned because they, that, was, that was an indication that they were using their own thoughts, their own opinions, and their own ways of doing things to speak on God's behalf. Now, the name Hosea means salvation. It comes from the name, same Hebrew root, Hashia, as the names Joshua and Jesus. Throughout the book, Hosea will show us that salvation is found in turning to the Lord and away from our sin. Hmm, sound familiar? Isn't that kind of the theme of the New Testament as well? So, the day, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Hosea's ministry spanned the years of 760 to 720 B.C., about 40 years, during the days of a divided monarchy. This was after day, days of David and Solomon, when the people of God divided in a civil war, creating two nations, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. This is some 250 years after the time of King David and some 650 years after Israel came into the promised land. So kind of see, you kind of see where the mind of the people are in that understanding. The kingdoms or the kings of Israel during the ministry of Hosea were these. Jeroboam II and Zechariah from the, de from, from the dynasty of Jehu. From the dynasty of Shalom, there was Shalom from 752 B.C. 752 B.C. It was one month. He was assassinated. The dynasty of Menahem there was Menahem from 752 to 7, 742 B.C. and Pekiah, 724 to 740 B.C. The dynasty of Pekah, 752 to 732 B.C. He was assassinated. The dynasty of Hosea, 732 to... Was Hosea... Well, oh, no. Hashia, not Hosea. Hashia. 732 to 722 B.C. He died in exile. So, these were the lineage of the kings in the time, the 40 years Hosea prophesied. Hosea began, began his ministry at the time when the kings were so, politically, were so politically successful and economically prosperous that people just didn't look to the Lord the way that they should. Seeds of idolatry, spiritual warfare, spiritual failure, and moral corruption sown in days of Jeroboam II produced a tragic harvest in the following years. So, let's look at that for a moment. Human history, human nature. When we have everything, do we need God? When we have an abundance of food, when we have we have abundance of money. Everything's going our way politically. Everything's going our way financially. If we are not with God, we kind of see ourselves as, well, I don't need him because I have everything. That is where Christians are different than unbelievers. Now, these, these folks were God's chosen people. God, God protected them in the 40 years in the wilderness. God protected them. God oversaw their, um, their protection. And yet they turned away because they had everything they needed. You ever had a time in your life when you were that way? I have everything I need. I don't need anything else. I don't need this or that or the other thing. I have everything I need. Have you ever been like that? I have. I think if we were honest with ourselves, we would say, yeah, I've been that way too. These people were that way. 
Significantly, Jeroboam the first was the first was the was the first king of a divided Israel, leading a pop popular revolt against the high taxation of Rehoboam, son of Solomon, 1 Kings 12. Jeroboam II followed in the wicked footsteps of Jeroboam. So he followed in the rebellion, in the revolt, and the mindset that caused that, the sinful mindset that caused that. Verse 2. When the Lord first spoke to Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take for yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land was, has committed great harlotry, departing from the Lord. So he was using this as an example <clears throat> of how, and we said it, saw it in the introduction, of how that relationship would be a picture, a spiritual picture, of the children of Israel and God. How they are spiritually bankrupt and spiritually uh, practicing harlotry and adultery before God. Now, that does not stop just because we have talked about it back in the, in the 700 B.C., Right? That is something that happens today. We are a people of God that we also, we can, in fact, commit spiritual adultery before God, even as Christians. When we go to things that are, bring us comfort other than the Lord, that's spiritual adultery. When we take part in things that are not of the Lord, that is spiritual adultery. We are, we, are, we are committing adultery against God. And that's something that we tend to not realize in our lives. God's first word to Hosea was something for his own life. This is how God almost, almost always works. Hosea probably would have preferred it if God gave him a word for someone else. But before the prophet can speak to the nation, he first has to hear from God for himself. So that is something that goes on in our own life. Now think about Hosea. Think about marrying a harlot. He knows what he's getting into, right? He knows she's not going to be faithful. He knows she's not going to stay with him. So all the heartache there, all the heartache that goes on in that situation of not, of not feeling fully that other person's heart. This person is going to be around with other men and probably have other children with other men, but he was, of course, supposed to marry her. Bringing upon heartache and, and, and sadness and sorrow to the prophet as a declaration, declaration of God's sorrow and heartache from his people. So he was going to feel what God feels to an extent. And that showing of that would be a picture of how God feels about the nation of Israel in that moment. So, God must speak to us or to the prophet first before he can speak to anyone else. For us today, that happens. God wants us to do something or talk to someone. God has to deal with us first. God wants us to be go and, and talk to other people <clears throat> about him. <clears throat> God wants us to, to be faithful in that. God has to talk to us first. What's holding us back? What's holding us back from talking to others? Why are we not? Why are we so, so shy? Why are we so nervous about it? Why is it not in our comfort zone? 
So God has to deal with us also. Hosea was told to take a prostitute for a wife. Why? Because the land has committed great harlotry by departing from God. So we talked about that. He was going to feel what God felt. He was going to feel what God felt. And that picture of that was going to show out on his face, on his countenance, for everyone to see. Verses 3 through 5. <clears throat> so he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblam, as a wife. She conceived and bore him a son. The Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel and will bring to an end the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of her, the bow of Israel, the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. <clears throat> so name him Jezreel as a remembrance for the prophet and for the people that they were going to be broken down in the valley of Jezreel. <clears throat> now, let's go on here. Jezreel and the name spoke of two, th of two things. First, Jezreel means scattered. And Israel would soon be scattered in exile by the conquering Assyrian army. Second, Jezreel refers to the valley of Jezreel where Jehu, the founder of the dynasty that put Jeroboam second on the throne, massacred all the descendants of Ahab, thus establishing his throne in 2 Kings 10, 11. God directed Hosea to name his son Jezreel to confirm his promise to avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel by judging the house of Jehu. So, he named his son Jezreel as a remembrance not for Hosea, but for those, the children of Israel. <clears throat> so they would re remember and recognize they're going to be judged for that sin going to be judged for that sin. Just as a house of Jehu would fall, so would the whole kingdom of Israel before the prophetic ministry of Hosea was finished. Israel was defeated, destroyed, and taken captive by the mighty Assyrian Empire in 2 Kings 17, 20 through 23. The bow was a symbol of power in the day, when, the, when it was the principal instrument of warfare. Thus, a broken bow symbolized a loss of power. So he was going to break their bow. He was going to take their power from them because of their spiritual adultery and their bloodshed. He was going to judge them. They were in captivity to the Assyrians and they had no power. We have that happen to us today. Whenever we have sinful behavior, God takes us spiritually captive and we have no power until we come back to him. Until we come back to him, we have to realize the power that Christ gives us. He gives us power to be called sons of God. We talked about that this morning out of the book of Ephesians. He gives us sonship. And if we are sinful in our lives, then that sonship is in jeopardy. And he will put us in judgment. The children of Israel were his chosen people. They were his chosen people, yet he had to discipline them. He had to discipline them because of their actions and their way of being. just as we have to be disciplined at times as well. Verses 6 and 7. 
Then Gomer conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to Hosea, Call her name Lo Ramaha, Lo, or whatever. <laughs> Lo Ra Roma. For I will no longer have mercy upon the house of Israel, but will utterly sweep them away. Verse 7, But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow or by sword, or by battle or by horses, or by horsemen. So, now, Judah and Israel, two different, Judah in the south, Israel in the north. One was following God, the other one wasn't. That's why Judah was spared, or Judah was saved. It says that he would, verse 7 says, But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God, and will not, sa and will not save them by bow, or by sword, or by battle, or by horses, or by horsemen. So it's not going to be anything outwardly that he's going to protect them with. It's going to be by the Spirit of God, by his protection, by his eternal and spiritual protection, showing his power, showing God's power to his people, to the nation of Israel in the north and the nation of Judah in the south. He was going to show his power to the whole nation. God was showing his power even in the salvation and judgment of each nation. The name Larama means no mercy. <clears throat> Every call to his child with the unfortunate name would remind Hosea and everyone else of coming judgment and exile. So God was not going to have mercy on them. <clears throat> he was going to bring judgment and exile. Yet I'll have mercy on the house of Judah. The army of, of Assyria that destroyed Israel also attacked Judah, but they did not conquer them. Instead, God miraculously fought on behalf of Judah against Assyria when the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 soldiers in the camp of Assyria in one night. So, we see God do this in another area, in another talk, in another thing, with, in the book of Judges, with Gideon. God used Gideon's faith to protect Israel. But Judah was going to be spared by an angel, by God's power, that was going to slay 185,000 soldiers and protect Judah. Why? Because Judah was faithful. Israel was going to be taken captive because they were not faithful. <clears throat> the fact that God had no mercy for Israel had, and had mercy toward Judah shows two things. First, it is true that Judah and her kings were more faithful unto the Lord during these years, as exemplified by King Hezekiah, in 2 Kings 18, 1 through 8. Second, it does not really matter if Judah was more worthy of mercy or Israel was because it, by its very nature, mercy is mercy. If one deserves leniency, then leniency is a matter of justice, not mercy. Mercy is only shown to the guilty. Therefore, it is within the wise and loving heart of God to show mercy to whom he will Show mercy, Romans 9, 15. But no one is ever unfair for not showing mercy. Now, Judah was more faithful under Hezekiah than Israel was under Jeroboam II. That's why there was judgment upon Israel. 8 and 9. When Gomer had weaned Loharamah, she conceived and bore a son. 
Then the Lord said, Call his name Loamani, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Another remembrance, another thing. You are not my people, and I am not your God. Why would God say that? It has to do with their attitude. It has to do with their loyalty. Where does their loyalty lie? God's loyalty is always toward us. Where's our loyalty? They were not faithful to God. And therefore, they had lost their place for, for a time of exile. They were no longer his God and he was no longer, they were no longer his people. No longer his people. So, begs the question of us. Are we God's chosen people? As believers, <clears throat> Israel is God's chosen people. We are grafted in when we are born again. Just like Israel can walk away and get judgment for their life and for their actions and for their attitudes and their, what's in their heart, we too, in 2023, can be judged by God for our actions and reactions to things in this life. God will say to us, I am no longer your God and you are no longer my people. Romans deals with this in Romans chapter 1. The word of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. To me that says, God is basically saying, you are no longer my people. What are they doing where the, where the word of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles? Because what were they doing? They were not following God. They were giving God a bad name. That's what they were doing. Verse 10, down to two, chapter 2, verse 1. Yet the number of the children of Israel will be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there it will be said to them, you are the children of the living God. <clears throat> then will the Judahites and the children of Israel be gathered together and the appointed and appoint themselves one head and they will come together come up out of it, out of the land for great will the day of be for great will be the day of Jezreel say to your brothers Amani and your sisters Ruthama now what does judgment do what is what does um, punishment do in a real sense? You know, you, you have, why do we do it? Why do we, why do we punish people? Why do we punish people in the legal system? Why do we punish our children? Why do we discipline? It's not to keep them acting out or disobeying or being disrespectful. It is to help them to be better. It's to help them to be more than they were before. It's to help them to understand that they need to be better. It says here, it says, Then will the Judahites and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head. So no more will it be Israel and Judah one head together. They'll be joined together. And they will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. So he's talking about redemption, restoration. This judgment is going to have 
a positive effect. They will come together. They will no longer be two separate kingdoms. There will be one nation. There will be one nation, the nation of Israel. It won't be the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. This captivity will cause them to draw closer to God. And that's what should happen with us, with discipline. When God disciplines us, it's not supposed to send us away. It's not supposed to make us dislike God. It is supposed to bring us closer to God. <clears throat> now, then the children of Judah shall, and the children of Israel shall, shall be gathered together. God promised a restoration so complete that the division caused by the civil war of Rehoboam and Jeroboam the, Jeroboam the first, a division that stood for 170 years would one day be erased. So this captivity, this judgment will erase that division. We, say, we, we can say that one way is this promise was fulfilled in, in, is in the church where God brings together Israel, Judah, and even Gentiles into one body in Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. Let's look at that really quick. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul's letter, second chapter. For he is our peace, who has made both groups one and has broken down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of the, com of the commandments, contained in ordinances that he him that in himself he might make the two into one new man thus making peace and that he might reconcile both to God into one body though through the cross whereby slaying the enmity <clears throat> so this Judgment, this exile to the Assyrian, to the Assyrian Empire of the, of the land of Israel was not to eternally damn them or eternally harm them, but it was to wake them up and one day they would be restored as one nation, the nation of Israel, where the one who would bring it all together, Jesus Christ, in his flesh, he abolished enmity. In his sacrifice, he abolished it. That is the law of the commandments, contained in ordinances that in himself he might make the two into one man, thus making peace. So in Christ, his sacrifice of crucifixion, death, and resurrection is to bring together, not to tear apart. It is to bring everything together. You can have families that are split apart. I was talking to someone the other day that said that they hadn't spoke to their child in 15 years because they were on the outs with each other. Families have those issues. But Christ can bring those together. Christ can heal those wounds. Christ can bridge the gaps. That happens in families. It happens in, <clears throat> in organizations, friendships, all kinds of relationships. Christ is the answer. 
There is no other answer. It's Christ. That's what Paul is saying to the Ephesians. And what is he, what, what Hosea is alluding to in Hosea chapter 1 and, ch and first verse of chapter 2. It is the Spirit of God, it is Christ who heals those old wounds. It is Christ who draws together, not brings it apart. The first child of Hosea and Gomer was named Jezreel as a sign of judgment. But God promised a restoration to com so complete that Jezreel would once again be the name of greatness, not judgment. Jezreel's, this, this, this restoration would be so complete. There would be no animosity, <clears throat> no hatred, no division. And that name would no longer be associated with judgment, but with restoration and forgiveness. That's how God, Jesus, can change things. That's how Jesus can change things in our lives and in their lives. When we surrender to him, when we say to him, you are my Lord, I am yours, and we fully submit, completely, we completely submit to Christ. We completely submit to God. He brings together those things. He brings together and heals the old wounds. We might even be angry with God. Christ can bring that together as well. Now, what in our life, what is it in our life where we have to say to ourselves, we can say to ourselves, and we have said to ourselves, I can't seem to get past this. I can't seem to move beyond this. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter to me, just... Think about those things. What is something that you, you're unable to, to forgive, you're unable to move beyond, you're unable to do? Think about those things for a moment and ponder the idea that in Christ, He heals all the wounds. When we sin against God, it is said that God, through Jesus Christ, throws all of our sinfulness as far as east is from the west. And that's really far. That's unending. So if he can forgive, if he can forget, because it says that he throws our sinful behavior in the sea of his forgetfulness. So if he can forget, and he can forgive, why can't we? Why can't we? Somebody says, well, I'm sorry that that happened. And, but then we say, well, well, and we say, well, I'm, in, in, in my mind, in, in our mind, we're saying, okay, yeah, we'll see. Time will tell. True forgiveness. Because God could say that about us, right? God will never do that again. Please forgive me. God says to us, you are forgiven. Throws it as far as east is from the west. Throws it into a sea of forgetfulness. What if God said, well, we'll see. Time will tell. What if God said that to us? Would there be any hope of getting into heaven? Think about that. If God lived, loved us conditionally. See, that's what's happening. We love others conditionally when we have it in our mind. We'll see. <clears throat> Time will tell. Now, we might say, well, you know, they've only given us a track record of, of, of not trusting them. And the past does play a part in the way we react to the present. But God is all-knowing. God knows 
our past. God knows our present moment. And God knows our future. So God knows right now that if we go home and tonight we do something we shouldn't, he already knows we're going to do it. And yet when we ask forgiveness right now in this moment, God says, I forgive you. I throw it as far as the east is from the west. God says that. Now, he already knows what tonight's going to bring. He already knows how we're going to react tomorrow. But yet today in this moment, he says, I will throw it as far as the east is from the west. You are forgiven. He doesn't say, well, you don't know what you're going to do tomorrow, but I do, so no, I'm not forgiving you because it's going to be wasted words. Do you, think you, do, you, do you think God would have a right to say that? I think so. If anybody has a right to hold a grudge, it's God because we continually fail him whether we want to believe it or not. We do. And God has the right to hold a grudge. So, what is our response when somebody says, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again? Well, we'll see. No, we're to forgive. We're to forget. Forgetting is hard, isn't it? Forgetting is hard. Forgiving can be easy, but forgetting is hard. Sorry, I'll never do that again. I forgive you. But then when things start to happen, right? Things start to go into place where you think, well, this happened before. Oh, no, we're heading down a, a, a wrong spot here. It's going to be bad. I know it's going to be bad. And then when it happens, you're like, well, I knew it. I knew it. That's not forgetting. That's not forgetting. Right? That's holding grudges. Holding grudges. Forgiveness can come easy. Forgetting isn't. Forgive and forget. It's easier said than, to, said than done, right? Forgive and forget. Well, you don't, you don't know what they've done. God can say that about us. He forgives and forgets, but he knows what we've done. He knows what we're going to do. The, ch the, the children of Israel and Judah were going to one day be all mended and all together, and God was going to forgive them despite what Israel did, despite what they did. So it's a wonderful picture of the love of God to us today. Amen? Forgive and forget. God does. God forgives and forgets. What about us? Amen? Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you today for your grace and your mercy. Help us, Lord, to look to you for peace, comfort, and, for, and, for, and forgive, for forgiveness and righteousness and holiness. Thank you, Father, that you do forgive and forget. Help us to be that way. Help us to grow in that, that we might be better today than we were yesterday. And Lord, we thank you for that. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to Stepping Stones of Faith. I pray that you find value in this content. You can also find an audio podcast of this program on all the major podcasting platforms. Just type Stepping Stones of Faith into the podcast search bar. Once again, I'm Pastor Josh. Thank you for joining me today.